through the book of Exodus tonight. So turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. As you're turning there, just to give you a little bit of um, intro, a little bit of preface to where we uh, recap of where we were last week, uh, where, you know, as far as their immediate past goes, their immediate past, the children of Israel. Well, we know that there's been a few things. There's been deliverance, there's been redemption, there's been celebration, and there's been refreshment. We've seen that illustrated since the time that they've left Egypt. They've been delivered. They've been delivered out of the bondage of Egypt. They've re been redeemed and as they um, were out of Egypt and they, and they crossed the Red Sea. Then we saw that in, verse, in chapter 15 that there was a time of celebration, a wonderful time of celebration as this first song being recorded for us in the Bible, this first recorded song of what God has done and how the children of Israel are, are seeing for the first time that they're singing to their God who has given them strength and has given them something to rejoice over. Incredible. It's really cool. And then we see also at the end of chapter 15, they came to a place called Elim. And this place was a place of 12 wells of water, 70 palm trees, and they were just giving a blessing. Also, we know that they had made previously uh, this place uh, to where they were getting some water to drink, and it was bitter. But God not only made it drinkable, but he made it very, very sweet for them. There's been one miracle after another. That's what's been great. We've seen and witnessed one miracle after another. So, verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 1, it begins by this. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, or Zin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, they departed from the land of Egypt. So what we have here is some timing. God has given us right here about that they've been in now in the desert since leaving Egypt uh, approximately 30 days. And uh, we know that by Exodus in chapter 12, verse 18, that that began that journey out. But we see here now they're 30 days into it. And there's been some stuff going on. There's been some incredible miracles going on. Uh, but then also we've already come to the first time to where they've already complained to Moses. Kind of cool, kind of interesting. You know, uh, they sang this song, Moses was loved by the people. Man, and it says that they just uh, loved Moses. It said in verse 14, they, they feared the Lord and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Hey, he was pretty much in their good graces at that time. But again, like I said a couple weeks ago, give them about 30 days. And then you'll hear their complaining. They begin complaining again here as we get into it. Um, and, but we see here that they're leaving a place, that place of Elim, as they're on their way to Sinai. They're leaving this place of comfort. And Matt, if you could put up on the screen uh, just their wonderings there. That gives you an idea of where they've started and where they're going to uh, ultimately to the land of Canaan. You see that they've made that big uh, a trough kind of thing. Oh, there's a little arrow. Uh, and you see it going down and up and around. So that is, of course, now they're in the middle approximately from the, the Nile Delta uh, coming across approximately between that part on the Sinai Peninsula, heading towards Mount Sinai, but they're approximately about in the middle there now on that downward slope. So uh, you can leave that up there, Matt. And so that gives you an idea about where they're at, where we're talking about, and then there'll be another slide that I'll show you as far as um, when God has given them the quail and he's given them the manna from heaven. But we see here that they're leaving from a place of comfort in these wonderful 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees to where anybody would love to stay. It's that oasis. And now they're going back into the desert. You know, a lot of times God will give us that time of rest, that time of respite. But you know what? There are times when that time is over and it's time to get back going to do the things that God calls us to do. It's great to go ahead. I love vacation. I think you guys like, who likes vacations? I, 
If you guys, Jeff, I know you like vacations. We, we love vacations. But you know what? We can't always stay on vacations, can we? We can't always stay on vacations. We've got to come back to our responsibilities, to the things that we're accountable to. I know the students, you guys are heading off on Thanksgiving break, but you got to come back to school in a week. Boo, you know? I mean, all good things like that. They, they will end. But you know what? These people, they have been in a neat place for a while, little while, but now they're continuing on their pilgrimage. Remember what a pilgrim is. A pilgrim isn't someone who's just wandering around aimlessly not knowing where they're headed. But a pilgrim is somebody who knows where they're going. They have a destination. And these folks are on a pilgrimage. They're heading to the land of Canaan. And in the meantime, God is going to show them some miraculous, miraculous things. So we see here that they're leaving this place of comfort now. They're heading back into the desert, going down now the Sinai Peninsula, and they're heading towards Mount Sinai. Voice, verses 2 and 3. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out, of the, out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Wow. How quickly they turn, huh? And now all of a sudden, they're pointing the finger at someone, huh? Moses. You're the one who brought us out here. And now they're starting to remember and starting to complain. Complain. Talk about being a little thankless. These folks right now are a little bit thankless. Have they forgotten so quickly what God did to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians as they had the Red Sea behind them, mountains to the right of them, desert to the left of them, no place to go. The Red Sea was parted. Have they not forgotten about all the different things that God did while they were in Egypt? Those 10 miracles, those 10 plagues. But you know what? Um, uh, I gotta kind of play the other side too. It's like, it's not without merit, really, they're talking about the food. It's really not without understanding because here they are, they've been through a lot, and now they're saying, hey, where's the food? But it's in the, the heart. It's in the tone of which they're doing it. And uh, we see, unfortunately, that they're, that they're missing the big picture. These folks have seen, so, have seen so much in their lives that they have forgotten how God is taking care of them. That's one thing to really remember in our lives as believers. Sometimes we can be going through these desert wanderings, these times of, man, what is happening, God? And oftentimes, I know I'm, I do the same thing. We often forget, I often forget um, how much God has taken care of me in the past how much he's looked after my needs, how much he's been there for me when I've needed him. And so we see here that these folks are kind of forgetting how God has taken care of them. Then they, then they lament in, in, in the second part of, of, of verse 3. They say, you know, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate the bread to full, man, they're, they're, they're lamenting. They're thinking back now about that time in Egypt. They're thinking back, and now they're blaming Moses and what ingratitude they have. The will of God for their lives doesn't seem to be enough for them. But what's important to them is the full belly. You see? That's what they're thinking about. That's what's important to them now. Not so much being in the will of God and that they're on that trek, that pilgrimage where God is pointing them and they're following diligently but they are concerned about having a full belly. You and I can be called what I would call revisionists. As we go through our life, we tend to revise our own history. We tend to kind of think and really tend to sometimes look back fondly on some of the things in the past. Maybe our before Christ days, those BC days, Oh, I remember the music I listened to, man, you know, uh, Jethro Tull and Led Zeppelin and all these groups I, you know, rocked out to. But you know what? That's, that's before Christ. 
That's nothing to glory in. That's nothing for me to have a desire to go back to. I don't desire to go back to those things. Why is that? Because I can see being in Christ is that better thing. And we sometimes revise the history of our lives as the children of Israel are doing and saying, you know what, man, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we, are, when we ate bread to the full, that's all they can remember. We have tendencies to forget those times and then the times that were not good. We tend to revise those. And, you know, God surely, surely brought them through all of the protecting, uh, bringing them out of the desert. You think he brought them out here to die? No, he didn't bring them out here to die. They kind of have a memory of inconsistency. They're kind of inconsistent in their, in their memory. What's more important, I ask you guys? What's more important, to, to be slaves in Egypt with a full belly or to be in the will of God and have a little bit less. You know, I, that, to me, that's an easy question to answer. It's a no-brainer. I'd rather have a little bit less and be in the will of God than to have a full belly and to be totally outside of His will. You know, we, we do, when we think about those times, our own personal times of Egypt, we forget many times how bad things truly were. And so, we see here that they're blaming Moses. They forgot. It's not Moses who's taking them into this place, but who? It's God. God is the one taking them into the desert, not Moses. The Lord is leading them out of Egypt. Kind of, we see here as we go on a little further in Scripture, it says... Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they walk in my law or not. Kind of interesting. And, you know, as we kind of look at these things, uh, uh, being brought out into the wilderness, the whole assembly saying that, Moses, they're, you're trying to kill us. And then, the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, okay, okay, I hear you, I hear you. I, I, will, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather. So God is making a promise as he's speaking to Moses here. He communicates to Moses and he says, you know what, Moses, I know the situation that you're under. I know what's happening out there. I haven't forgotten, but know this, what God is doing. As he sees the situation and he says, you know what? I will rain down bread every day to feed them day by day. Every day he's going to do this. But day by day, he will be giving his provision. Why? Why just day by day? Just enough. A certain quota. Why not just, why doesn't God just go poof? A bunch of storehouses, here's some neat air-conditioned trailers and all your food's refrigerated and just truck it along onto Sinai or onto Canaan. Why doesn't he do that? He could, but he doesn't. But he gives them just enough day by day by day. Why does he do that? Well, remember when I, if you guys have been with us since the beginning of Exodus, one of the things that I've seen here in Scripture is that in that 400 years while they were in Egypt, they, they knew of God, but they didn't have a relationship with God. Here God is nurturing His children by giving them just what they need every day. Just enough. Not too little, not too more. And so we see here He's nurturing a, a personal relationship with His kids. That's what He's doing. He's building also a personal dependence that they are to have on him. He says, I'm not going to give you such surplus and such overflow that you won't need me anymore. And you know, that's how it is in our lives too. We have, if we have so much, why do we need God? 
We have so much in our bank accounts. We have so many cars, so many houses. Who needs God? A lot of people think that way. A lot of people are that way. But I know for a lot of us, God gives us just what we need. Just what we need day by day. It allows us to be nurtured by him and to understand that we are to have a personal dependence in our lives for the Lord. Why? So they'll grow. You and I, are called to not stay in the same place as believers, but we're called to grow. We're called to mature. No better way than to be dependent upon the Lord, allowing the Lord to allow us to grow and to grow us. So these folks are going to have to trust him one day at a time. One day at a time they have to trust him. You and I, hey, we want more. We want a 30-day supply, right? We want a 30-day supply, but not this time. Not this time. It's one day at a time. You know, one thing, as I see, and I, I believe God does this in our lives as believers, one thing that this does by giving us just what we need in our lives, day by day, is to help us see His miracle his miracle of love, his miracle of grace, his miracle of provision in our lives. I mean, I think about it. It's like, if God just opened the gates, oh, that's wonderful and it's a blessing, but there wouldn't be that dependence. There wouldn't be my ability to depend on him day in and day out and then see his glory revealed by his provision, whatever that may be. I'll miss out. And it helps us see his miracle. And, and I see this miracle. And then I acknowledge it. And then I become dependent. And then I become thankful for what he's done in my life. See, that, that's how it works. And, and then he gets all the glory. I love the daily life that I have in God, in the Lord the big things and the little things, the daily life, just having a car to drive, you know? I'm so thankful now that I got a car to drive because with Patrick going to college, he's got the other one, and it's hard. You guys maybe who have one car, you know what it's about. You know, you're always having to be thinking about things and planning and, and, and shifting schedules around. Man, just to have a car to drive is a blessing in and of itself. To be able to wash our clothes in our homes, not having to go to the James River and beat on a rock, right? How about the ability just to have our, 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 our dishes washed in a dishwasher? Wow, what a great convenience that is. Those small things, clothes to wear, those are the things in daily life that we should be going, wow, Lord, thank you. Thank you for these things, Lord. He doesn't give us too much doesn't give us too little, but he gives us just the right amount so that we will continue to be dependent upon him. And here he tells them in the scriptures that they're to be taking this manna every day. It says in verse 4, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. Every day. Why? Well, he tells us why. He says, to go out every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. To test them. Will they walk in his law? Will they walk in his law? We'll, we'll, we'll find that out. We'll find that out. Verse 5 says, And it shall be on the sixth day when they shall prepare what they bring in. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So they're talking about that sixth day that day of the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath day of rest, that they're to collect more to hold themselves over for that day. And it's very interesting, if you read ahead, on what happened with some of the people who decided to take a little bit more than what they should have taken, and you're going to see what happens to that manna. The scriptures will tell us what happens. But also, this day, this day being before the day of, of the Sabbath rest, rest that 
that Shabbat that they have, that they call in Israel and, and around here as well. But we see here then that there's another thing going on here that I want to bring your attention to. In the scriptures, we're talking a lot about manna. We're talking about bread. And now this bread, this manna, there are many things in the Old Testament that are going to point us to Jesus Christ. And this manna, this bread, points us to Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you will, to John in the New Testament. Chapter 6, John chapter 6. Here we see where Jesus is going to apply this particular event in the Old Testament to himself. He's going to do that. John chapter 6. Tell me when you're there. John chapter 6. Say, I'm here. You're here? Okay. I'm not. So hold on. Let's go to verse 49. It says, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of this world. You see how we, how we can look in the Old Testament and how this bread is giving life to the children of Israel and how Jesus Christ also says of himself, saying that I am the living bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. No different than the manna that came down from heaven. He did the same thing. And if we eat of this bread, he will live forever. Then he says, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Wow, that's incredible. We see here that this bread, you can turn back to Exodus. We see here that this bread, this manna, is a full-on picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's great. Another picture of Jesus, is, as it did come down to heaven, like I said. Uh, in fact, I'm so sorry. Let's turn back to John 6, another verse I remember. Um, let's turn back to John chapter 6 a little bit before. Should have told you maybe to keep your fingers there, but I remembered this one just now. See, I had 49 through 51. Okay, here we go. Oh. For the bread of God, verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, another reference to Jesus Christ, the bread of God. He's coming down from heaven, and what does he do? He gives life. He gives life to the world. You see, without Jesus Christ in our lives... We're dead. We're dead. Without Jesus Christ in our lives, we are dead. How do I know that? Well, the scriptures say that he, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He gives life to you and me. Now we can turn back to Exodus. So we see here that other picture of Jesus. Jesus. Now, a failure for the, for the children of Israel, a failure to eat this bread would result in physical death. As the same with Jesus, spiritually, to not partake of this bread of life will result in a spiritual death. This manna fell into the wilderness, fell down from heaven in the wilderness just to give them strength, to give them life, just as Jesus gives us strength and life in the wilderness, spiritually in this world, this wilderness that we're in. 1 Corinthians 10.3 says, all ate the same spiritual food. All these folks ate the same spiritual food. We do the same as believers of Jesus Christ. The second area that I see here too in, in just kind of looking at Jesus and the manna is that this manna 
fell down to a rebellious people. These people were rebellious. They weren't all going along with the program, but they were rebellious. Just as Jesus comes into this world to save a rebellious people, that's you and me. We were equally rebellious, but Jesus Christ fell as the manna fell into this world to save a rebellious people. Romans 5 brings this out. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he, he came down from heaven, that life, that bread of life, that manna, and he came down to save us. That's the neat correlation we see, see here, and that's, that's the neat picture we see with the bread, with the manna. Now, verse 6, it says, Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know, that word in the Hebrew is yada, that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. That word is, is you can replace that word of know and with the Hebrew of, of understanding. At evening you shall have understanding what the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. He says, you'll know, you'll understand what God has truly done for you. Verses seven and eight. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full for the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. He says that a second time. We see here in the scripture, it's interesting. It's interesting about complaints and complaining. As the children of Israel are complaining to Moses, he's saying, hey, look, what are we? Are we that you complain against us? And then in the other verse, verse 8, he says, you know, your complaints are not against us, but they're against the Lord. When we complain, it's interesting. There are people who are chronic complainers. But one thing to understand is when I complain, that I complain about what the Lord is doing in my life. I complain about what he's doing. And any time I complain, it's always then, in the life of a believer, a complaint against the Lord. Because he is the one, if I'm correct here, I know what the scriptures say, he is the one who, do, who orders our steps. Right? He orders our steps. So if we complain, we're complaining about what he's doing in our life. And there's a second ramification of that for us as believers as we complain. When people who don't know the Lord, they hear the complaints by his people, it turns people who don't know the Lord away. Amen. Why do I say that? Amen. Well, they figure, and rightly so, they figure this. If I'm complaining about a God that I profess to love, and a God that is a God of provision, and a God is a God of mercy and grace, yet I'm complaining about what he's doing in my life, why would they want to have a God like that? Amen. You Come see? On. So we just kind of, we, we want to just kind of be a little careful there. They're saying, you know, gosh, why do I want a God who won't even help his own people? Because they don't understand. So it does damage. Verse 9, it goes on to tell us. And then Moses spoke to Aaron, saying, to all the congregation of the children of Israel. Remember, there's two to three million, Okay. So it's incredible how he did it. But to all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. This is the third time that Moses tells them this. Verse 10 says, Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Okay? So we see them, uh, it's daytime, the glory of the Lord appears um, in the cloud. Now we go on, verses 11 through 14. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and at the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that, so it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted there, on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. Wow, it's kind of cool what's going on here. We see that um, God speaks to Moses. He's saying, you know what? I recognize and I hear the complaints from the children of Israel. And guess what? At twilight, you shall eat meat. Now, Matt, if you want to do the other slide... Uh, we can see where they're getting the other one. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Quail manna. How long has it been up there? <laughs> Thing. Oh, he's fast. So that's where you see about where they estimate traditionally where, you know, again, they're 30 days only into their trek. So they're figuring they're about in that area there where it says the quail and the manna. So, you know, they're, goodness, not even one third done with their, with their, with their uh, pilgrimage. And, and already God is, is, is looking to, to show them uh, provision for them. And he hears them and he listens to them. And so we see here that this quail that he's given them, this meat, God loves his protein. So he gives them this meat. And now they have a provision of food. And one of the things that I see here that's kind of cool, if you go down to verse 14, it says, speaking of the manna, it says, uh, and the layer of dew lifted there, and on the surface of the wilderness there was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So, a small substance that's left, that the dew as it's gone uh, on the ground. So God makes them this promise. God makes them this promise, and now it's appearing on the surface of the ground. This also is a picture of Jesus, this description that we have was small. Jesus was small when he was born. He was covered in humility, covered in this dew as this manna was. Jesus being that small little baby. Um, and then also just seeing this as a picture of his incarnation. And it's pretty cool as we just continue to, to look at the scriptures here and say, you know what, Lord, there, there, there's Jesus there's Jesus, covered in his humility. The dew covered the, the manna. Verse 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. They'd never seen anything like this before. They'd never seen anything like it. So what do they say? They say, what is it? I don't know what it is. Never seen it before. That's actually what manna means in the Hebrew. It means, what is it? It's interesting, though. As you see in different portions of scriptures, in Nehemiah 9.15, Psalm 78.24, and Psalm 105.40, God always refers to it as not manna, what is it? But he always refers to it as the bread from heaven. The bread from heaven. I like that. Psalm 78, 25 calls it angel's food. Kind of interesting. So we see here, we go on forward that this, in verse 16, it says, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So we see the bread was to be supplied to them. But, interesting, it's not like, okay, you look out your tent and it's brought to you. But, you know, you had to go out and get it. You had to go out for yourself to partake. You had the freedom to partake or not to partake. You understand what I'm talking about? You had the freedom to go out and collect your portion or not. God isn't forcing them to do that. God gives them just enough for that day, but he's not forcing them to go out and eat or partake. People today have that same choice, spiritually. 
they have the same choice to partake of the bread of life or not. Really, they do. Another picture of Jesus, like I said earlier, is that Jesus never forces himself on anybody. He never does. It's up to us. Jesus gives us a choice. This omer is a little bit less than two quarts. And um, in fact, in verse 36 at the end of this chapter, it says, now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah, which is uh, greater, but this, this omer is a little bit less than two quarts. Verses 17 and 18, it says, and the children of Israel did so and gathered, some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over. And he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. So here we see they're being obedient. They did so and they gathered some more, some less. Pretty, pretty explicit. No one had any need. There was no one that had an overage of it. Verse 19 and 20. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. It's a great word, huh? It's stank. It's a great Hebrew word. It stank. There's a reason for this. Again, God didn't want them to store anything up. He wanted them purposely to depend upon him. And so here it says, notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part until the morning. They didn't finish that portion that was given to them. God said, eat of it all. Otherwise, these worms came out of it, and it stank. He says, you needed to eat it all. No saving it for the next day. Why? Why did they not want, why did God not want them to save it for the next day? This is a faith issue. It's an issue of faith. Remember we're talking about dependence upon God for our daily needs? It's an issue of faith. He's telling his children, children that you need to trust me daily, daily for your provision. And God is saying, I will provide for you. I'll provide for you, he says. So trust me. No need to save some for the next day. So, he goes on, he says, Verse 21, so they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Verse 23, then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and did not, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. You see, again, we're talking about what God is asking them and God is directing them. When God says, hey, don't take any more than what you need. Don't take any more than what you need. If he says, go ahead and take provision for more, take provision for more. Those things don't end up smelling and they don't end up producing any worms. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Commentator said, when God puts us in a place of need, he wants to do more than meet the need. He wants to teach an eternal lesson. I really believe that. You know, spiritually speaking, we can't live off yesterday's relationship with the Lord or yesterday's fellowship with the Lord. We can't do that. Otherwise, our flesh becomes rotted and worms are produced, you see? 
We can't say, oh, I remember when I, you know, yeah, I used to go to church, and oh, yeah, I remember this, 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 this church I was going to, and I was like on fire here, and I was, oh, yeah, it's great brother, great sister. Okay, that's yesterday's fellowship with Jesus. What about today's fellowship with Jesus? What about today? Because if we aren't continuing to do the things of the Lord, then we also rot. And our flesh rots. It's kind of like doing this. Kind of like taking a shower. I was trying to think of an illustration. Is all I could think of. So sorry if it's kind of like hokey. But it says, it's like taking, I said, like taking a shower. It's like, you know, you're there and you're saying, you know, I'm lathering up and I'm rinsing three times in the shower for the next three days. And then I don't take a shower for three days. I mean, I lathered up and I rinsed off. I lathered up. I rinsed off. I lathered up. I rinsed off. And then I do it three times? Well, I have to do this every day. Or spiritually, you know. I'm going to have a really busy, busy day the next two, three days, Lord. So today, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read five chapters today. And I'm going to be covered for the next three, four days. Right? Wrong. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. We must be in the word daily. Otherwise, that sweet aroma of rotting flesh comes around. And we go, man, I haven't been in my devotions. I've seen my countenance change. I've seen my heart change. I've seen me be impatient. I've seen me be judgmental. I've seen me be critical. That's why we need to be in the word every day. Every day. So that's what happens. Stinkola happens, huh? Woo. I don't, I, I, my wife can tell when I haven't been in my devotions. She lifts her nose up and starts to smell. It's true, because she'll ask me, have you been in your devotions? I go, no, I didn't get to them today. She goes, I can tell. I can tell. Verse 21. So they gathered it every morning and every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. This is a, a, a kind of a neat picture on how when we receive fresh fruit, food from Jesus before the day burns it away. And that's why it's kind of cool. If, and, and I know all of us try as best as possible to, to when we get up to try and do that first thing with the Lord and do our devotion sometimes because of our schedule. It doesn't work out that way. But, but continue to be encouraged to do your devotion, whether you can do it in the afternoon or the evening. Still try and do it, but there's one thing again, like everybody says, and it is true, it is true, that that first time in the morning, God gives you that fresh manna. First thing in the morning. And it lasts you the whole day. That's your provision for the day. It's, it's, a, it's a neat picture on how we're to receive food when we do receive food from Jesus Christ before the entire day just burns it away and wastes we receive it. Verses 22 and 23. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the Sabbath rest, holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil. Lay up for yourselves all that remains, so be kept until morning. So they did do this. They, they laid it up till morning, and as Moses said, it's neat that this manna, it's neat that you can bake it or uh, you can boil it and it still tasted good. Verse 25, then Moses said, eat that today for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now here's one for the record books. Verse 27, now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Kind of cool. 
one, per, one portion they were to take. Uh, and then as we read a little further, but let me share something with you. I happen to have in this bag manna. It truly is. It's something that will sustain me. And it's round, kind of like it. But you know what? I want to taste what this sweetness is. And I want to be able to enjoy what Jesus has for me. And so as I taste this manna, dip it in honey, it's really good. Anybody want to taste? Jack, do you want to taste? It's really good. This is how good God is. The sweetness of honey applied to manna. Traditional, the traditional thought in the Jewish traditions is that manna, the manna tasted like anything you wanted it to taste like. Something that you just loved. That's Jewish tradition. Whether that's true or not, it's tradition. So if I love steak, hey, guess what, man? I just had a porterhouse, and it's great. If I love biscuits and gravy, oh my goodness, great gravy and biscuits. You get the point, I think. But the thing is, is that that's how good God is, and that's how sweet He is to you and to me. And so we see here, as we go on further in Scripture, that this thing called manna just gives the description and the taste of it. Then Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. What's he doing here? Well, what he's doing is exactly what he says. He's asking uh, them or asking Aaron probably to go ahead and say, hey. In fact, he does because in the next verse it tells that he's to go out and he's to, hey, Get some of this manna, put it in a pot. It's to be put into a pot, and, and that's when it talks about being in the, the, the ark and of the covenant, and you have the pot in there, you have Aaron's rod in there as well, and the, and the Ten Commandments. And that was what was in there, in a golden censer or a golden pot. And verse 33, it says, And Moses said to Aaron, uh, Take a pot and put that omer of manna in it. Lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. So they will see how good the Lord was. And they will see exactly how the Lord provided. You know, it's a memorial. It's something to remember what God has done, much like the Passover that we studied already. And the Lord commanded Moses, verse 34, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony um, to be kept. What is the testimony? Well, the Ten Commandments of God they're going to be given to Moses soon here. But this testimony, that's also referred to as the ark, the, the, the ark of the testimony, um, or the testimony referring to the Ten Commandments. Frankly, I, I don't know if it's one or the other. The scripture is not clear on that, so I don't know. All I know is, is that in Scripture it does refer to, um, in fact, I'll read it to you, the, the tabernacle, the great glory of which that was that it contained the testimony, the two tablets, tells us in Exodus 38, 21. The ark in which these tables were deposited was called the Ark of the Testimony. It's Exodus 40, verse 3. And also simply the testimony. So by this time, it hadn't been given yet, but he says, hey, you know what? Lay it up before the testimony to be kept. So we see here then, verse 35 and 36, and the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land that ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. I'd like to read to you what a commentator said on, these last, on this last verse, verse 35 in particular. He says, See how constant the care of providence is. Seed time and harvest fail not, while the earth remains. Israel was very provoking in the wilderness, yet the manna never failed them. Thus still God causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The manna 
is called spiritual meat because it was typical of spiritual blessings in heavenly things. Christ himself is the true manna, the bread of life, of which this was a figure. The word of God is the manna by which our souls are nourished. The comforts of the spirit are hidden manna. It tells us that in Revelation 2.17. These come from heaven as the manna did and are the support and comfort of the divine life of the soul while we are in the wilderness of this world. What's this old-timey commentator saying, whom I love, and I can't remember his name, but he said it so eloquently. He's basically saying, God is always there. He's our Jehovah Jireh, and he does not fail us when we are, while we are still in this world. Regardless of our complaining, he still provides that's something to rejoice about. Also that Jesus Christ, being the true manna, all is contained in him and through him, which we are to receive our daily portion. Remember that. How do we receive this portion? The spiritual meat. Well, like the commentator said, like we've said many times, it's through the word of God. That's how we receive it. This, this is, is our manna, guys. You read this, you get fed. You get nourished. And, and, and God will reveal incredible things to you through this book and through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this time. And Lord, I thank you that um, we can see the picture of your son, Jesus Christ, all throughout the Old Testament, and particularly in this chapter. Speaking of manna, bread, Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the manna falling from heaven, he coming down from heaven. Lord, uh, it's so, so much Jesus is in it. Lord, give us eyes to see that, Lord. Give us uh, an understanding, Lord, that we will know truly that your son is the only way, that your son Jesus is the only sustenance, the only food that we are to be taking in, God. And God, that we're not to revel or, 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 or romanticize the things of our, of our lives before Jesus Christ. Let us not desire for pots of meat, Things to fill our bellies with, Lord. All the while not being in your will. But Lord, let us be in your will, that we have that desire to be in your will, even if that means we may go a little hungry. So God, I pray for everyone here tonight, Lord, that Lord, that if they are going through, anyone is going through a desert wandering, a wilderness experience, that, God, that you encourage them by these words that we've read tonight. That, Lord, daily we need to depend on you. Daily you will sustain our needs. And daily we are to trust. Lord, you're wanting us to grow. You're wanting us to be built up and mature. And, Lord, may we boast about the things that you're doing. Boasting about your son, Jesus and how faithful he is. So God, tonight we just again thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we all say, amen, amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Uh, hey, ladies, do not forget that this Saturday, 9 o'clock here is the ladies' uh, women's ministry uh, Bible study. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. So definitely be great to see you guys all here. And if you want to taste manna, I think I've got an extra piece here for you guys. So God bless you. Have a great night.